Hi everyone, I'm Sarah Henry, the Robert A. and Elizabeth Rome Jeffy Chief Curator and Deputy Director at the Museum of the City of New York. And welcome to our first ever installment of Curators from the Couch. This is my couch. And you're going to join uh, the premiere of our new live stream series of conversations in which curators from the Museum of the City of New York sit down virtually with New York City artists, experts, activists, and influencers for discussions about exhibitions and programs at the museum. So over the next 30 minutes, we'll be talking with two of the many artists who have pieces in one of our current exhibitions, who we are, visualizing NYC by the numbers. My guests are Brian Fu, an artist and computer scientist who, among other things, is innovator in residence at the Library of Congress, and Georgia Lupi, noted information design guru and partner at Pentagram. So the exhibition in which Brian and George's work is featured, called Who We Are, Visualizing NYC by the Numbers, is presented at the Museum of the City of New York to coincide with the 2020 census. And it examines the importance of the population count, how and why it's done, and what's at stake. And the show is all about how data, such as the millions of pieces of information gathered every 10 years by the US Census, can reveal important insights about who we are as a city. And how in the hands of creative artists and designers, data can be not scary or dry or confusing, but insightful, provocative, maybe disturbing, maybe humorous, emotional, relevant, even beautiful. And the show is also about how important the census is, how important it is for funding for our city, for our political representation, and for how we plan for our city going forward. And so since this weekend is the Census Digital Weekend, when everyone is encouraged to fill out their forms from home, we thought it was a good time to talk with some of the artists who we have worked with, who use and think about data, and also to talk about what data can tell us about who we are. And we hope that this conversation will educate and inspire you. And as our guests are presenting, please feel free to ask questions in the Facebook comments. So um, speaking of inspiring, uh, let's meet our guests. Let's start with Brian Fu. Brian, your piece in the exhibition is actually not only about visualizing data, but also about sonification of data. Tell us what Two Trains is about and what your thinking and the process behind it were. Absolutely, and uh, yeah, thank you for having me here. This is uh, an amazing opportunity, uh, especially to be doing this with Georgia, who uh, I've been following for a very long time. Um, so this piece is actually part of um, a bigger project that I had called a data-driven DJ, um, and the goal was to try to think of ways to um, communicate uh, various public data sets uh, using the medium of music. So um, a lot of this was trying to think about, um, you know, what, 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 what are the strengths that music has that say like a chart or a graph or, or more traditional ways of visualizing um, um, has. Uh, um, and this particular piece uh, uses uh, census data, um, and it also combines it with subway data. So, so this is actually a ride along the two train, uh, which goes from the Bronx through Manhattan uh, into Brooklyn. Um, and it has um, a particularly high uh, level of inequality in terms of the, the, uh, the neighborhoods that it passes through. So what this um, piece tries to do, it tries to kind of simulate a ride uh, along the two train and the the sounds that you hear in a given moment corresponds to the median household income of the neighborhood that you're passing through so the 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 idea is that the um if there is any contrast in the data uh it should be expressed in the contrast of of the music itself 
So it's using um, you know, what music does well, which is um, uh, it, it communicates change. Um, it also um, you know, affects, has the potential to affect one's mood, um, which, which kind of was the very interesting part of this because you know, typically as a data scientist, one doesn't want to bias you know, the, the, the listener or, or uh, the audience. Um, but you know, music just naturally does that. So I had to kind of think very critically um, how to make the data, um, uh, how to kind of transform that into music in, in, a, in a responsible way. So, so basically how that works is that um, the higher the median household income of the neighborhood that you're passing through is, uh, the more instrumentation uh, I have for the song as well as um, uh, how loudly they're playing. So, so the quietest part of the song is um, around kind of the South Bronx. Uh, and it kind of slowly increases in volume. Um, at, at, and it kind of has a crescendo when it reaches um, uh, the financial district. And, and you know, the difference in numbers is like, you know, you know over, over uh, like a quarter million dollars uh, uh, for the financial district to like, you know, under $20,000. So, uh, and that's in like under five miles. So, so um, it, it translates to a very dynamic song. Um, which is the hope uh, that I wanted to um, uh, uh, have as an experience for this piece. I was muted. Thanks, Brian. That was great. Uh, we're delighted to have this piece in, in the show. Um, so Georgia Lupi, we were so thrilled that you and your team created a, a brand new piece for our exhibition, Who We Are. Can you tell us a little bit about this work and what inspired you? Sure, and uh, thank you so much for having me. This is this is such a pleasure, and I'm um, really excited to be here with Ryan as well. So um, it is, as you mentioned, Sarah, an original piece that we did um, that we called What Count. It's an original design. It's an interactive installation um, in the spaces of the galleries, and with this piece, we kind of question the fundamental information that are asked on the census, trying to add a speculative layer of more human nuances. And so as you see in this image, what counts as two core components, a large projection on the gallery wall and an interactive iPad interface in the middle of the space. And so as they walk by, visitors can answer a short questionnaire on the iPad about themselves and their identity. Um, and for example, here um, in the next images, Julius, thank you so much for skipping in that uh, for me. Um, here are some of the questions. So if you had to pick only one, which of the following best describes you? Are you responsible and reliable, ambitious and driven, imaginative and created, and so on? And uh, compared to others, I believe I am completely unique, unique in most ways, unique in some ways, but similar in others. Um, one other that you can see here, if you had to pick only one, which of the following is most important to you? Do you live by your values, earning fame of recognition? Um, and so really, really trying to add questions that can shape your identity, can create, you know, an image of your identity. How do you personally define home as opposed to, you know, where do you live on a zip code? Um, and then do you feel that what you currently have in life is enough? Um, and so really, you can really see as you as you pass through these questions, this one is there's one about what you will hope the next generation, the, the next generation will enjoy better than you. So thinking about yourself, your relationship with others, your relationship with the future, how you define yourself as a citizen. Um, and finally, is the future bright or green, which um, I know that this is a question that, you know, asked now might have had different answers that, you know, when we asked it. Um, but then, then, so, you know, as you, as you might have guessed, then a unique visual symbol is generated on the iPad as you move through the survey, and is what we call the data portrait that actually represents the combination of your unique answer. So it's really the symbol that defines it. And once the survey is completed, you can really physically swipe your data portrait to the gallery wall, um, where it will actually join these animated projections that you were seeing in the beginning that can be in the next image. Um, of all the data portraits that have been collected since the beginning. Um, and then in the next um, video, you'll see that your portrait is contributing to this dynamic graphics on the wall. And uh, we, of course, conceive the questions as provoking responses to the questions they're asking the census, which are pretty much only demographic. Really, 
inviting us to think about how do we want to be counted and what matters the most um, to count about us. And as you can see in these images, we intentionally designed this data portrait as hand-drawn and imperfect, contrasting with the clinical charts that are typically used to visualize census data and really trying to um, represent our human nature. And um, then as you can see here in the projection, each element of the portrait is also visually unpacked and explained. So we're also revealing the singular responses to each question and we're collecting data to date. So, um, you know, we, we could really see how people, uh, how many people who participated cluster around a specific answer to a specific question. Um, and then, Julius, if, you, if you're going to go ahead, uh, one the, or even the next slide. Uh, so in the gallery, a legend is, of course, goes through the projection to interpret what you're seeing. So to give visitors really the tools to understand what they're seeing. And finally, um, to be reminded of the collective experience after you leave, then you could also print your unique data portrait on a button. Um, to take home with you and where, and that happened in the museum shop. And you can see some of the first one that were printed. Um, and um, of course, they're always hooked to a legend so that again, you can um, be home, um, remember this experience and have something that talks about yourself. And so the installation will continue as continued to collect data throughout the months, in this case, also creating a visual record of the visitors of the museum. And to tie it back to my practice, um, it's, it's always a way for me to show the data that we don't see and to show all of these layers of data um, that um, really represent the ideas and the unexplored questions about ourselves and our society, and then through design, um, making it visible. Thank you, Georgia. Uh, we're so delighted to have this at the Museum of the City of New York and to see all the responses our visitors have been putting in. It's really grown as a collective experience over the months since the exhibition opened and we're really looking forward to opening again so we can continue to add to this. Um, so I wanted to, um, to ask both of you because I think the works are so different in some ways, but in some ways they're dealing with some of the same questions. and. Um, Brian, when you were talking, you, you mentioned the emotionality of music versus the um, supposed objectivity or lack of emotion of da data uh, and, and the tension that you felt as a data scientist uh, between the emotion, between objectivity and subjectivity being pulled in both these ways. And I think all of the, just the very idea of doing data-driven art or in the case of our exhibition, exploring data through art. Um, I was always sort of somehow navigating that line between fact and feeling, between objectivity and subjectivity, or is it? Is there no tension at all? So I wanted to hear from each of you what you think. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. This, this project uh, felt that t tension directly just because of the nature of music. Um, but, you know, there's always that, that bias, and I'm aware of even just the, 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 the data set itself, you know, that there was a decision to, for that data be, to be collected, um, and, and, there, and the, there was my selection of the data, um, and then obviously how it's uh, presented. So, um, you know, as somebody who's both an artist and a computer scientist, mm -hmm. um, I, I, I try to, I guess, immerse myself in that, in that conflict. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and to and also to just to make it very transparent, you know. So in my in all my work, I try to explain my my creative decisions uh, as well as the technical code that underlines uh, the generation of this this music. So so this particular piece is actually uh, generated from a computer script uh, that anybody can use and adapt with their own data. Um, I actually generated this piece. Uh, using uh, new data. So I, um, the original piece had like data from maybe 2015. So I updated it for um, uh, this particular exhibit. So um, hopefully, you know, people can look at my process and, and agree or disagree in, in, in how I, um, you know, translated that. But I, I, I welcome that conversation. <laughs> yeah, and uh... Well, I think for me, our piece responded actually to the to the questions that are asked in this in the census, and as I explained, we called it "What Counts," really to um, make us think about what matters to be counted and actually how we count things. And to your question, Sarah, I think that. I mean, data are never objective because they always, and I like to use the plural for data, like data are. Um, so data always come from a set of questions and they always come with a, um, 
with a person or someone who decides to collect them. And the, the way that a data set is, even if it looks the most objective piece of information we have, really depended on you know, what has been collected and what has been left out. And I think that in this case, thinking about our identity and how we want to be counted as citizens, that was a way to be like, how many questions we can actually um, use to turn disinformation and thoughts into a data set. And uh, there are definitely many more that have been asked, but I think that the tension between the objectivity and the subjectivity to me, pretty much most of the time um, goes towards subjectivity, because again, how data are collected really inform the lifespan of a data set, any type of data set. Because again, even if it comes from a sensor, Again, a human being designed the census and decided what to collect and what to leave out. So. Right. So, so maybe it's not so much about objectivity and subjectivity of this content, but about the artistic practice and how many decisions are in the hands of the artist versus how many decisions are not in your hands. Because, Brian, you were talking about the decisions you needed to make and you know that you are a player in the, the construction of this subjective view, but you're also um, mobilizing information that is not under your control, mm -hmm. right? And the uh, all of these pieces that deal with data are somehow playing that line, the relationship of the artist to the, the content that, um, that, they're that they're representing. Anyhow, um, I wanted to ask each of you how the piece, these particular pieces that are on view in who we are relate to your, your broader practice uh, because both of you have lots of work that you've done in lots of different media. Um, and is this an extension or um, a departure? Is it speaking to themes that you've visited over and over again? Um, Brian's on my screen, so I'll let sure. him uh, jump in. <laughs> Yeah, I think, um, you know, my background is um, I'm very much involved in, you know, libraries and museums and mm -hmm. public resources. So I'm very interested in, um, you know, thinking about how we can make public resources like, you know, data sets, um, uh, various mm -hmm. materials more mm -hmm. accessible to the public. And, and by accessible, I mean all the all the definitions of success, uh, accessible. So even just having it physically or, or digitally um, available uh, for download and reuse, uh, but also thinking about how um, it can reach the, um, the, the, the end user, the audience, uh, in this case, the listener, um, and how they can kind of connect to, to um, a particular data set that, that would otherwise be inaccessible as like a very large spreadsheet or something like that. Um, so, so I've, I, personally, I'm very interested in exploring um, uh, you know, non-traditional media uh, and, and different um, mediums that, that might match particular data sets uh, uh, better than others. Um, so in this case, music, uh, but in other cases I've used, you know, like a porcelain dinner set or I've used, um, you know, light bulbs in my house and um, just thinking about how to, how to, um, yeah, connect, connect and, and make accessible certain, certain data sets. Yeah, and it's so interesting to me also because you mentioned the physicality of those things, right? The materiality mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. uh, things, which we don't always think of as existing in the same world as data. Um, and then as a museum curator, we, we thought a lot about and worked with our designers, isometric studios, and with all the artists um, to, to think about what does it mean to bring these artworks into physical space um, where people are engaging them in, as they move and socialize when the galleries are open. So, um, George, did you want to say a few words about uh, how this relates to other, the, your broader practice? Sure. Um, I mean, this is really, really related and it's an evolution of what I've explored for the past years. And it, it really lies around this umbrella that I call it a humanism, which is really ultimately trying to reconnect numbers to what they stand for and to make them relatable for people. And in general, exploring themes through data, through this lens that we can use to abstract reality, that themes that are speaking about us, our identity, what makes us who we are, our human nature, our society. And so I'm much more interested in personal questions and questions about our society and relationship, which is something that I've explored in all of my personal projects, but also mm -hmm. in clients' work. I think that 
even if a, I mean, I'm a designer primarily, so I don't define myself as an artist. And uh, in, in my design practice, um, even when I work with clients um, that might come to us with a given data set, uh, we always with my team try to kind of like even question if these are the best data that they might want to collect. You know, what is the, what is, what are the reason to collect a certain data set? Is there something that we can add to speak to your customer, visitors, readers in a way that make them feel um, that they can relate? And so again, kind of like trying to add and highlight the human side of data. So definitely this piece is in, um, in great conjunction to what I've done over the years. So you, you talked about the relationship between data and society, human life, of course, and so much of our society and our human life has is, is been turned upside down over the last month and a half with the COVID-19. Um, it's it's disrupted, disrupted so many things, including the census itself, which was the, the um, occasion for this exhibition. Um, for each of you, I'm curious um, if if anything about the events of the last two months would change any, any ways that you're thinking about the work that you did for this exhibition or that you're doing going forward, if you were to do this piece that we just looked at again now, in this moment, would it change? Uh, if, would, would there be an update to it someday? Would you ask the same questions? Um, are they evergreen? Or might they, might they get disrupted in some way like so many other things in our world? Georgia, you're still there on the screen, so. Yeah, no, I could go first. Well, I think the questions that we asked, um, well, still keeping in mind that this is an exhibition that links to the census. Um, mm -hmm. These are kind of like evergreen question. What I think is that people might answer differently after this moment in time, because ultimately, if we're thinking about identity, well, our identities have been, for most of us at least, or I mean, I'd say for some of us, has been have been kind of shaken to the core of, you know, who we are, like what really makes us who we are, what are the things that come up for me, what are the struggles, what are the fears, what am I, what are my strengths, what are the essential things that define myself now that I'm not going to work every day, that I don't necessarily need to wear a suit or anything, so I think that um, maybe people would reply in a different way. I, if I could add a question or two that are really related to this period, which might not be the case because we not, not necessarily want to, you know, want to tie it, but there will be one about the present in the sense that what comes up for you, uh, what are the feelings and struggles and ideas and uh, the most burning feelings that come up for you in this moment, but also how do I want my 2021 to be or how would I want to be myself? I will be in 2021 or 2022, so what are the things that I can see about the future um, coming from this period? Brian, do you want to? Do you want to jump in? Sure, sure. Yeah, I think I think one um, aspect of this of this piece that especially New Yorkers connected with was it had to do with the subway, which uh, which is uh, you know very, has been very much of an equalizer because uh, um, uh, you know a lot of people from all different backgrounds and demographics have used the subway. Um, you know, I think one thing that struck me, and I, I don't have the data for this, but I've kind of seen various articles about it, is that there, there's a different kind of inequality kind of going on. Uh, on the subway where, where uh, more likely somebody from a lower income um, uh, neighborhood would be using the subway now because they have to, um, okay. whether they're an essential worker or they just depend on the subway. Um, so I think it would be interesting to kind of potentially use like ridership data uh, and it would almost create the opposite song, you know, uh, uh, where, where the, um, the loudest parts would be in, you know, probably the Bronx and, and, and further out in, in Brooklyn. Um, and, and you know that that would just be just a very interesting um, juxtaposition. Uh, um, yeah. yeah. Yes, something. Maybe we'll have a chance to do that project sometime. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, we're we're getting close to the end of our time, and my colleague Robin has been watching the Facebook. Uh, and uh, Robin, do we have any questions from our audience that we might want to pose to our guests? We haven't gotten any questions, but perhaps somebody, one of you, could answer. Um, sort of what you guys have coming up next and what you're most interested in um, moving forward. I think our audience would be interested in that. Brian, go ahead. <laughs> oh, sure. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so I'm currently working with the, um, the Library of Congress uh, as an innovator in residence. So uh, I'm working on another music-based project. Um, it's, it's a little bit of a different um, kind of use of music, but it's called Citizen DJ. 
uh, and it invites uh, the public to use um, free to use audio and video material from uh, the library's collections uh, in hip hop production. Um, so it, it tries to, again, kind of make accessible uh, some of the amazing public materials that the, I, I guess that we all have uh, in our kind of shared collective sonic culture um, to, to make something new. Um, so, so that's that's one thing I've been working on. And I think I've been fortunate to, um, you know, I, I work very much digitally uh, and online. So, so you know, that that uh, those projects have been able to continue and, and hopefully will become a resource for, for uh, especially musicians who, who have uh, been hit particularly hard um, in these times. Um, but yeah, that's that's what I've been uh, working on. Yeah, and, Are you Georgia? Yeah. So yeah, at Pentagon we have we have still like projects with clients that uh, have been kind of like maybe delayed in time because there are exhibitions. There's there are exhibition that uh, I can't really name names out, but uh, an interactive exhibition they were excited about. They will open hopefully in the new year in Chicago. Uh, working on campaigns um, with the Gates Foundation, and uh, we we have some exciting projects. I, I would I would want to add that right yesterday. Um, I think it's a, it's a good closure. We released a speculative project that we did as a labor of love because we really love how governors Cuomo's every day present data and information online and we just released um it's on the Pentagon website it's on my account and uh, we've been interviewed in Post company a it's not a redesign but it's like some additions that I, as information designer we would do to help um you know citizens that every day check constantly uh these numbers really contextualize them and put them in a bigger trends and uh, we've been really excited about the very positive comments that we received we have no idea if the governors will ever see it, but um, <laughs> we're really happy to put it out in the world well it just reinforces uh the point that you made uh and you and when you spoke at the museum uh a couple months ago and that you just reiter reiterated uh georgia that data is an abstracted representation of our reality and it's therefore a lens and filter we can use to see our world through. And those numbers that we listen to every briefing, you know, they're part of how we understand what's happening to ourselves, our city, our nation, and our world right now. So I guess I just have one more question. Have you filled out your census yet? I have. Yes. <laughs> yes, good. That's one. Brian? Um, I am embarrassed to say I have not yet, but I promise to. But you will. Uh, <laughs> I almost filled this out. I filled it out. I almost filled it out before this event because I knew you were going to ask that question, but that seemed kind <laughs> of seemed dishonest. <laughs> yeah. No, no, that's good. It's good to show, it's good to show that we're, we're all in the same boat. We're all yeah. humans, and yeah. it's so important we all know to fill out that census. It's important yes. for our city. It's important for all of us um, to to be able to create an understanding of who we are collectively. Uh, and as they say, if you want to count, you have to be counted. And um, we, we really can't understand our, ourselves as individuals or as a, a collectivity without some, some good data to start with. So everyone should go do that uh, for sure. So um, thank you both so much. This, is the, this brings us to end of our, our very first installation of curators from the couch, here I am. Um, thank you so much, Brian Fu and Georgia Lupi for this really great conversation. Uh, and I want to thank our co-curators, uh, Kubi Ackerman and Mancho Lopez for having been such great collaborators on this exhibition and, um, and to the whole MCNY team who are, are, are pulling the levers behind the scenes and making sure that we could bring this content to you. Um, as we are all here on our couches. So um, I do want to let you know that we have some new other live stream conversations coming up as part of the museum's public program series. One week from today, we're going to have cartoonist Roz Chast uh, on May 8th. And on May 11th, uh, author N.K. Jemison, who's also featured in Who We Are, uh, she has, um, she'll be speaking to us on May 11th and with us. And to learn more about our exhibitions or find out about future live streams and other events, you should go to mcny.org. Please feel free to share the link to this conversation and to everything else we do. The, uh, the websites of our guests uh, are available to you here too. Thank you so much, Brian and Georgia. Thank you everybody who's signed in and we'll, we'll see you next time. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.